We're live. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Weiss. I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a steering committee member of the NDP Socialist Caucus. We acknowledge that this gathering takes place on the Indigenous lands, including the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat and the Audenoshawnee people. We join in the fight for uh, justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assists of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight, webcast is titled The History and Practice of Socialist Action and the Left in Canada. I am your host, and I am joined by Barry Wiseletter in Toronto, Yvonne Hansen in Vancouver, and Robbie Mahood in Montreal. Barry has been a political activist for over 52 years. That includes decades of work as a union organizer and leader, and as an international solidarity and anti-war campaigner. He is the chair of the NDP Socialist Caucus, Federal Secretary of Socialist Action Canada, and is co-editor of Socialist Action Monthly Newspaper. Barry will speak for about 20 minutes, and Yvonne and Robbie will speak for about five minutes each, after which we will go to questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question by accepting, ac accessing the website directly from YouTube and by typing the questions directly on the chat column. We welcome your questions, so please uh, write them up. Our presenters will do their best to answer them. If you like the webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during the program, please join Socialist Action by signing up on our website, www.socialistaction.ca, or by calling 647 986 one nine one seven. That's six four seven nine eight six one nine one seven. So let's begin. Welcome once again to our show, Barry. Barry, take it away. Barry, you are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you and, and good evening everyone. Socialist action is 26 years old, but it didn't suddenly appear. It didn't spring from the head of Zeus. It emerged organically from concrete conditions. To understand those circumstances, some background is needed. And this is the 103rd year since the triumph of the first so successful workers' revolution, the Russian Revolution. It changed the political landscape and the left irrevocably. But we need to go back just a little bit farther. The socialist revolution, for the first time in class divided society, brings the majority of humanity to power. It requires a workers' party and a workers' state to lead the transition and to overcome the resistance of the hitherto privileged, powerful, and ruthless minority. The transition to workers' power cannot be achieved spontaneously or in a decentralized fashion owing to the centralized nature of existing minority class rule. In addition, the uneven development of nations and the desynchronized nature of class conflict worldwide impose the need for greater solidarity and stronger political organization of the dispossessed. Fundamental differences over questions of party and state led to the first major split in the workers' movement, the split between Marxism and anarchism. For anarchists, Individual self-expression takes priority over the collective discipline necessary to expropriate the expropriators and to create a worker state to effect the transition from generalized poverty to generalized freedom from want. The second major split occurred over reformism. Revolutionary socialists have always been in the forefront of the fight for reforms. That is evident in the Communist Manifesto of 1848. Reformism, however, is the doctrine of a gradual transition to socialism relying on the accumulation of reforms. It fosters illusions in the neutrality of the capitalist state as the vehicle for reform. Thus, it subordinates workers, or at least those workers who subscribe to this illusion, to the preservation of the system and its state. Gradualism, or evolutionary socialism, combined with 
huge party and labor union bureaucracies transformed the socialist or second international into a pro-capitalist party that capitulated to national chauvinism and to imperialist war. The split in the second international over the treacherous program and practice of social democratic reformism led to the formation of an internationalist anti-war left wing at the Zimmerwald conference in September, 1915. Following the Russian Revolution, this regroupment led to the foundation in 1919 of the Communist or Third International. In Canada, the Communist Party was formed in 1921. Its founding convention took place in secret. We think it took place in a barn near Guelph. Many of its initial members came from the left wing of the reformist Socialist Party of Canada and the Social Democratic Party of Canada. The Russian Revolution was besieged by hostile imperialist armies. It suffered enormously from its isolation and economic backwardness. A bureaucratic party elite, represented by Joseph Stalin, seized control, curtailed workers' democracy, crushed socialist opposition, and adopted a new program that over-adapted to capitalist rule outside the USSR. The perspective of world revolution was replaced by the false utopia of socialism in one country. Permanent revolution, that is, recognizing the need for a workers-led revolution to lead the social transformation, especially in the poor countries, was supplanted by the old, discredited Menshevik notion of revolution by stages. The stages theory relies on an alliance with the liberal or nationalist bourgeoisie. Socialist democracy was replaced by bureaucratic tyranny accompanied by elite privilege, false propaganda, show trials, torture, and the assassination of political opponents. The divide in the Stalinist-dominated communist international gave rise to the international left opposition in 1930 and the formation of the Fourth International in 1938. Leon Trotsky, co-leader with Lenin in the Russian Revolution, played a leading role in the preservation of revolutionary Marxism and its further development. Trotsky's analysis of the phenomenon of Stalinism and the phenomenon of fascism in the 20th century was particularly significant. The Fourth International began as a small movement of educational groups in just a few countries. In the 1960s, it attracted thousands of young militants spread to all continents and became a more substantial force in a number of countries, including France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Brazil, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. Its ideas are very influential in Latin America and Europe today. The revolutionary continuity of the Fourth International in Canada starts with the Canadian branch of the Communist League of America in the 1930s and proceeds through the Revolutionary Workers' Party in the 1940s and the League for Socialist Action in the 1960s and 1970s. But during the Cold War, at the height of McCarthyism, that is the late 1940s, there were splits from the Fourth International reflecting the pressure of the capitalist ideological offensive. One current that split away from the Fourth International developed the theory that the USSR had become capitalist, or rather state capitalist. That designation meant that in any conflict between the USSR and US imperialism, workers should take neither side. This third camp position was extended to China, North Korea, Vietnam, and Cuba. Instead of defending the worker states against imperialism, including defense of the relatively healthy worker state and revolutionary leadership, Cuba, and instead of calling for a political revolution to replace the Stalinist dictators with socialist democracy in the other worker states, the third camp proponents abstain from this struggle entirely. Objectively speaking, this stance supports the imperialist-dominated status quo. The Socialist Workers' Party in Britain and the International Socialists in Canada belong to this current. And on revolutionary Cuba, they are counter-revolutionary. Another split from the Fourth International, which occurred in the 1950s, bent the stick in the other direction. It attributed revolutionary qualities to Stalinism and derivative currents such as Maoism, Titoism, Ho Chi Minh, Enver Hose, Kim Il-sung, etc. This current abandoned the idea of political revolution 
to establish socialist democracy in the deformed worker states. A group called the Workers' World Party in the US represents this tendency. A group with similar views called Fire This Time operates in Vancouver. The Fourth International divided in 1953, but it reunited in 1961 on the basis of recognition of the Cuban Socialist Revolution and its historic significance. But some Marxist groups rejected Trotskyist reunification on the grounds of a different assessment of the Cuban Revolution and of the Vietnamese Revolution and of black nationalism in the USA, of feminism, and of the new student movement. Those groups traveled to what I call political outer space to be joined by others later on. They all began their journey to Never Never Land by denying the new revolutionary political realities. This led to ultra-left sectarian positions. Um, for example, and this is actually true, um, there, was a, there was a tendency in the anti-war movement that advanced the demand for the entire movement, all Indochina must go communist, rather than the slogan that um, was adopted by the broad anti-war movement on a principled basis, U.S. out now. And in Canada, U.S. out and Canadian complicity uh, must end. So this fostered abstentionist practice, this ultra-leftism, which beget internal cultism, artificial self-generated campaigns, undemocratic mini-dictatorial regimes, conspiracy theories, um, and a morbid preoccupation with attacking the sects closest politically to their own particular deformations. The most egregious examples of this phenomenon are the Trotskyist League and the Bolshevik tendency. And frankly, those groups uh, deserve one another richly. Some leftists, in an overreaction to this sterile brew of sectarianism, abandon revolutionary theory and organization altogether. They stumble backwards to um, reformism. This is what happened to the New Socialists, a group that originated in an anti-Leninist split from the IS that occurred 28 years ago. The New Socialists converged with the left reformist socialist project headed by Leo Panitch and Greg Albo. As the name implies, the socialist project does not favor the formation of a party. Project, not a party. In reality, it is a network of academics, ex-union bureaucrats, and radicals. It has a sectarian attitude towards the NDP, a passive stance towards the labor bureaucracy, and no political intervention into the social justice movements. The SP believes in reforming the capitalist state from within, although ironically, it is electorally abstentionist. Another group on the scene is known as Fight Back. It's part of the international Marxist tendency. Now, when it was present in the NDP years and years ago, it refused to build a united NDP left wing, such as uh, the Socialist Caucus organizes. Fight Back devotes most of its energy to building student groups on university campuses. It is a Canadian chauvinist organization on the Quebec national question. It opposes the boycott divestment sanctions campaign for Palestine. It says it divides uh, the uh, working class in Israel. In the third world countries, its sister organizations join populist capitalist parties, such as the ruling PPP in Pakistan and the PRD in Mexico. The main Trotskyist party for 40 years, the Socialist Workers Party, degenerated in the late 1970s and 80s. It broke with permanent revolution and in 1983 expelled its Trotskyist cadre. The Communist League is the affiliate in Canada of the SWP and it exists now only in Montreal. It abstains from anti-war action and it equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And what about the granddaddy of the radical left, the Communist Party of Canada, from which we, uh, in socialist action, trace our origins. While well, the Communist Party is reformist and Canadian nationalist to the core, it is a sclerotic shell of its storied past, both unwilling and unable to break with the sad legacy of Stalinist treachery and repression. As you can see, the English Canadian left is littered with political detritus. The Quebec left has its own similar story, and Robbie will talk about that. The divisions on the left are rooted in history and are rooted in strategic, programmatic, and operational differences. 
if all the existing forces of the radical left were suddenly to combine with all their differences intact, the result would be as unstable as nitroglycerin. Soon enough, such an unprincipled body would explode into an array of fragments, further demoralizing everyone within its reach. But knowing all this, why can't the various groups recognize reality and arrive at principled unity? One reason is the relatively low level of class struggle in this society. A higher level of class struggle would rapidly put many different theories to the test. It would help to separate fact from fiction and would separate correct ideas from wrong-headed ones. Unfortunately, socialists are compelled to work under existing conditions, not under those we might prefer uh, conditions we, that we might choose. We can't afford to wait until conditions are more to our liking. That is, if we really want to influence conditions in a revolutionary direction and ultimately to win. Furthermore, we know that class struggle is ongoing and it is global in nature and that revolution is an outcome of that ongoing process under specific conditions. Socialists strive to advance the class struggle where we live and work and to mobilize support for worker struggles and especially for revolutionary breakthroughs wherever they occur. That is the approach of socialist action, League pour l'Action Socialiste in the Canadian state. SA is a democratic centralist political organization that stands on a revolutionary socialist program. From where did socialist action come? Well, the League for Socialist Action fused with the Group Marxiste Revolutionnaire and the Revolutionary Marxist Group in 1977 to form the Revolutionary Workers League. The RWL made big errors of tactics and orientation in its first four years. It adopted an extreme turn to industry tactic, pressing its white collar worker members to quit their jobs, to go to work in factories and to do passive propaganda there, essentially just selling the paper at the plant gate. The RWL became intolerant of dissent. It shrank down to a tiny rump of itself. And emerging from the ruins of the RWL were uh, the Socialist Workers Collective and the Alliance for Socialist Action, which joined Socialist Challenge in English Canada and Gauche Socialiste in Quebec. Very you muted Barry. yourself. You muted yourself. Okay, this technology is a little tricky. The screen went blank, and to re recharge it, I pressed the key, and that muted me. So we're back now, and you can hear me. At least I hope so. So the um, the socialist challenge and the gauche socialists drew the wrong conclusions from the experience of the RWL. As I was saying, their leaders blamed Leninism for the fall of the RWL and the radical left in Canada, instead of blaming the decline in the class struggle that occurred in the 1980s. They blamed the, stra the strategy of revolutionary party building, instead of blaming cultism and get-rich-quick schemes. Then the SCGS expelled the proponents of party building in its ranks. They wanted to build a loose network, not a revolutionary workers' party. The ex Trotskyists of the Socialist Challenge, Gauche Socialist, expelled me and Elizabeth, your host for tonight, um, in 1993 for what? For insisting that the policies adopted at convention should be implemented and that members should pay dues, attend meetings, and sell our press. Uh, that was Leninism too, too much for them. A handful of comrades joined us, and together we founded Socialist Action Canada in 1994. Socialist Action USA, which arose from expulsions from the SWP, as I mentioned earlier, um, supported our efforts generously. We appealed the expulsions in Canada to the World Congress of the Fourth International in 1995. The FI designated Socialist Action Canada, quote, a group of partisans of the FI with the agreement of Gauche, um, group of partisans of the FI that is invited to participate in the meetings and activities of the FI with the agreement of Gauche Socialist, close quote. But the GS did not subsequently agree. It has blocked our participation in the world movement for over 25 years. And that organization 
doesn't even really exist anymore. They claim 10 members, but that's probably an exaggeration. So what are we to do? Well, we are remedying that situation now, working with Fourth International Comrades in several countries and with socialists outside the Fourth International as well. Socialist Action is committed to building a Revolutionary Workers International. SA is actively involved in a variety of political campaigns and in a number of social movements, including for indigenous rights, for an end to poverty, for feminism and ecology, and in opposition to racism, homophobia, and fascism. We are in solidarity with revolutionary Cuba. We defend self-determination for Venezuela and support movements of anti-imperialist resistance in Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Haiti, among other places. Our primary orientation is to the working class and to its labor and political institutions. Unlike the rest of the left, socialist action is not just present in mass working class organizations. We are actively involved in building a class struggle left wing opposition in the unions and inside the labor based NDP. Other groups on the left either abstain from the NDP arena or they adapt to the treacherous policies of the NDP leaders. Neither course is the way forward. Socialist action practices participation in the struggle for socialist policies and for a workers' agenda as explained in the booklet, Prospects for Socialism in Canada. In other words, we are for conflictual participation, not for political submission, not for cheerleading, not for abstention in relation to the NDP and the labor movement. So what has socialist action accomplished? Well quite a lot for a small party. We played a very visible role in the days of action in Ontario, the general strikes that occurred in 10 cities, especially in Toronto in October 1996 against the conservative Mike Harris government. We built international solidarity, defended workers' strikes and public services, such as, for example, when Justin Trudeau ruled that the postal workers in the fall of uh, 2018 uh, had to go back to work, he violated their right to strike. We worked with many others to block entrances to postal plants in late November and early December 2018. We opposed imperialist wars and we confronted racists and fascists in the streets. We successfully fought for anti-war and socialist policies in the NDP. The Socialist Caucus, which we lead, won the NDP to demand Canada out of Afghanistan in 2006 and initiated the leadership review in 2015 that led to the replacement of Tom Mulcair. Socialist Caucus comrades have been elected to NDP District Association president, even won an NDP candidate nomination in 2011. Two NDP federal candidates in 2019 joined Socialist Action after the election. An SA member won election uh, to the OPSU uh, provincial executive running on an explicitly class struggle platform. In fact, that has happened more than once. SA helped to launch the Workers' Action Movement. The Workers' Action Movement ran candidates for president and vice president of the Ontario Federation of Labour, and our candidates won over 36% of the votes cast at the OFL convention in November 2019. We plan to run candidates, Workers' Action Movement can, can, will, will run candidates uh, at the Canadian Labour Congress convention when it occurs. It was, of course, cancelled uh, this past May for due to the COVID crisis. One minute. Socialist Action has introduced thousands to socialist ideas through our rebel films, forums, May Day celebrations, concerts, study groups, and our annual Trotsky School in November. Our party has members across the country. We host a monthly Zoom conference. Each June, we hold a cross-country educational conference and a convention for members to decide matters of policy, campaigns, and orientation, and to elect a central committee. Today, Socialist Action is growing rapidly, tripling in size over the past two years. Members pay monthly dues, sell SA newspaper, and attend meetings on a regular basis. New members pass through a provisional membership period for three months to determine their suitability for um, uh, full member status. We place a high priority on education, both internally and externally. We practice democracy in discussion and unity in action. All members, including leaders, are duty bound to carry out the adopted policies of the organization, unlike labor and NDP leaders who often disregard convention decisions in favor of their personal positions. So we practice what we preach and we preach what we practice. That is enough to shine a bright beacon of hope in a dark, tormented and cynical world. 
Education is inseparable, is indispensable for those who want to gain a better understanding of the world, which is why we place such a great emphasis on it. Socialist Action is an organization for those who want to change the world. SA is for people who want to replace the tyranny of capitalist minority rule with the immensely creative potential of a democratic cooperative commonwealth. Membership in SA is not a right, it is a privilege for those willing to dedicate themselves to that goal and to make the sacrifices necessary to advance the process to achieve it. No worker strike, let alone any social revolution, is one, without, is one without great effort. But with it comes knowledge, skills, comradeship, solidarity, and the satisfaction of knowing that one's life is linked to the greatest possible purpose, total human emancipation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Barry. Okay, so now we're going to move to uh, Vancouver. So welcome, Yvonne. I understand you were the NDP candidate in Vancouver Granville in the federal election last October. Of course, shortly afterwards, you joined Socialist Action, elected to its national leadership in June 2020. You also serve as Vancouver's Socialist Action Coordinator of Environmental and Indigenous Solidarity Work. So I'm wondering in your presentation, if you would uh, tell us a little bit what, about what convinced you to join revolutionary socialists in British Columbia. Absolutely. So after the NDP, um, after running with the NDP and after the election, um, there was just kind of like this big void because you're doing so much work every day, meeting so many people, having so many great, amazing conversations about issues that really, really matter um, to yourself and to your community, that, you know, once that's all gone, I, I personally was just looking for something, for anything. And so I was going around with as many socialist activist groups as I could find and just trying to find my place and find my people. And um, so after the election, at some point, I'm not sure if it was Gary or Ellen or somebody came up to me and they said, um, do you consider yourself to be to the left of the NDP? And I uh, sheepishly was like, well, yeah. Uh, and they said, well, I, I think I might know some people who you might be interested in meeting. And so uh, a few nights later, we had our inaugural meeting. And at this point, the West Coast branch of Socialist Action had not become a thing yet. Um, and so this meeting was just kind of getting some people together who had been involved in the election, um, some other candidates, and just seeing who would be interested in being a part of maybe having a socialist action branch in British Columbia. And it was actually in the restaurant right next door to my campaign office that we had this meeting. Um, so there's some good memories there. And so she looped, so after, after I was looped in with Gary, um, one thing led to another and I, it was kind of a whirlwind at the time, um, but the next thing I knew, I was flying to Toronto in November to give a talk at the socialist action conference. And I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but what I saw at that conference really solidified my resolve uh, to join Socialist Action. Um, and I, I really realized that these were the people that I was looking for. These were my people. Um, it was a group of about 60 socialists or more in one room. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, there might have been 70, which to somebody who's used to seeing about five at a table at a time was pretty incredible. <laughs> there was red and yellow flags all around the room, zines, pamphlets, uh, secondhand revolutionary literature on the, on the side table for sale. Um, and it really felt like I had found um, kind of home. And after the conference, we all went out for a round of drinks together. And that's when the real debate and discussion started. And it was just so encouraging to be around like-minded folks. Um, everybody had the same kind of core sets of ideas. You know, we're, we're revolutionaries, we're not reformists. And so we had some great times sort of ranting about how strange it seems to work within a system to abolish that system. Um, Everybody has different takes and perspectives um, owing to their own different walks of life, which is exactly what a revolutionary collective and a working class party needs to look like. Um, we need to have that diversity, but also that commitment to a single set of ideals. Um, the BC branch was brand new, uh, but I attended both the inaugural meeting and the planning session. I really liked that even though socialist action was well established in Canada, that I would get to have a hand and a voice in building the operations on the West Coast. Um, it was really refreshing also to be a part of a group of left-wingers with resources that wasn't a established political party. So due to the requirement that members pay dues, there are resources available for banners, for flyers, stickers, pamphlets. We have money to help spread the word and educate others on the working class cause, which was incredible. 
Um, the internal structure of socialist action is also highly democratic, which I really appreciate. Um, it doesn't feel like decisions are being made unilaterally, um, which has often been the case with other activist groups that I've been part or like activist groups that I've been a part of. Um, it doesn't feel like the mandates are coming from the top down, and I've been able to have a really equitable role in in making those mandates happen. Our convictions are coming from our members. Um, finally, I also really appreciate that socialist action fights hard for reform within the NDP. Um, we have members who are card carrying. NDPers. Uh, we have members who are who have run for office with the NDP, myself included. Uh, I am a member of the NDP, and I do love a lot of their policies. But I see a lot of room for improvement, and I, I don't like a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I'm proud to fight along other alongside other members of Socialist Action to pull the NDP to the left, build the working class base we need, and actualize the socialist policies that we really, really, really need to see in the next election cycle. We are really fighting the good work here in Socialist Action. I am so proud to be a part of this organization. And thanks again for having me on this webcast. Thank you, comrade Yvonne. OK, so now we're going to move all the way back and down the highway to Montreal. So welcome, Robbie. I understand you are from originally from Saskatchewan, where you studied to be a doctor. Uh, as an expression of your commitment to women's rights to choose abortion, you headed to Morgan Teller Clinic in Winnipeg for years. You were the Quebec Solidaire candidate in Montreal Côte de Neige district. So maybe you can tell us what are some key ways in which the political landscape and the left in Quebec differ basically from those elements in English Canada. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll try to do my best. Um... We've certainly seen a, a downturn in the tempo of the class struggle over recent years in Quebec. But I just want to remind the audience that this could change rapidly, judging from historical precedent. We just have to cast our minds back to the mass Quebec student strike of 2012 or the huge demonstrations against the Iraq war of 2002. <clears throat> Even now, uh, protests on the streets of Montreal, from the climate emergency through anti racism, to international solidarity are routine, routinely larger than the same mobilizations in Toronto or anywhere else in the rest of Canada. I don't mean that as a slight, but it is true. And, and, and why is that? Well, I think among the mass of ordinary Quebecois, there's an unmistakable alienation from the dictates of capital, whether it emanates from Toronto and Ottawa or from New York and Washington. It's Quebec's status for as an oppressed na national minority within the Canadian Federation that is at the root of this alienation and that explains the political and social volatility we see in La Belle Provence. The sense of national grievance reinforces the Quebecois identification with capitalism's victims and its readiness to take to the streets in protest. At the same time, we have to remember that this alienation can turn inward and be channeled into xenophobia or other regressive campaigns at the service of reactionary demagogues. And there's a little bit of that flavor in uh, Quebec as we speak, although I don't think it will last long. Now, social democracy became a significant force in the workers' movement in English Canada. However, it failed to do so in Quebec. And that's because I think of its blindness to, well, one of the main reasons was its blindness to Quebec's national oppression and its loyal and the loyalty of Canadian uh, social democracy to the federal state. On a smaller scale, the Stalinist Communist Party, Party also paid the same price. Over time, the NDP has made accommodation to Quebec nationalism, but never uh, embracing uh, the cause of national, of full national liberation. The dramatic upsurge in class and national struggles in Quebec from the late 1950s to the 70s produced a split in the Quebec Liberal Party, leading to the creation of the Parti Québécois. And Quebec's quiet revolution, which many, as many have observed, was neither quiet nor quite a revolution, uh, it produced a combative labor movement, without any doubt. In the end, though, Quebec's unions did not take the road of class independence as the labor movement did in English Canada with the launching of the NDP in 1961. Instead, the Quebec labor bureaucracy subordinated itself to the bourgeois nationalist Parti Québécois 
Quebecois, a party that paraded in social democratic clothing, but gradually revealed its reactionary character over the ensuing decades. One could say that in Quebec, nationalism substituted for social democracy as a way of advancing a progressive reform agenda that led to certain changes that were beneficial to the mass of working people. The last Quebec provincial election in 2018 saw a weakening of the two main capitalist parties, the Liberals and the Parti Québécois, who had alternated in power over the previous 45 years. And instead, the right-wing Coalition Avenir Quebec, the CAC, playing on latent racism, was handed a majority. A weaker but still significant polarization occurred to the left, and this was expressed by the relatively strong showing of Quebec Solidaire, which emerged to challenge the Parti Québécois among Francophone working class voters and youth. The federal NDP, that is the Quebec section of the federal NDP, has yet to recover from the orange surge of 2011, which sent almost 60 Quebec NDP MPs to Ottawa. But this was followed in a fairly short order by a rapid fall from grace as Tom Mulcair helped pave the way for Trudeau's victory in 2015 and gave the Bloc a new lease on life in Quebec. Even with its decline, the federal NDP still garners around 8% of the vote in Quebec and clings to a small base in terms of seats uh, in the east end of Montreal and in certain other outlying parts of Quebec. Another misjudgment of the NDP tops was to relaunch a provincial NDP absent from provincial politics for 30 years. This amounts to a sectarian slap in the face to Quebec Solidaire for its embrace of Quebec sovereignty. Deservedly, the provincial NDP got under 1% of the vote. The NDP is weaker organizationally and on the ground in Quebec than in the rest of Canada. Leavened by the radical political atmosphere in Montreal, however, this gives the dissident currents in the party, like the Socialist Caucus or Courage, a certain advantage. And these groups are active in the province. Although far from being a labor or a socialist party, Quebec Solidaire has a mass membership and audience. It sits astride the path to Quebec's national and social liberation for better or for worse. And indeed, it may turn out to be the latter, that is for worse, since the party shows every sign of traveling down the path of programmatic moderation and parliamentarism. Quebec Solidaire has also so far rejected running federally, leaving its supporters to support the federal NDP, the Greens, or the Bloc. Take your choice. And this further dilutes uh, QS's working class credentials. In the meantime, Quebec's union leaders sit at, on the political sidelines. They may retain a capacity to mobilize the ranks, but are careful not to let the dynamic escape their control. Now, we'll go on to talk a little bit about the far left in Quebec. Historically, uh, the far left uh, in the, the radicalization of the 1970s produced relatively large Marx, uh, Maoist groups. And even the Trotskyists, especially the predecessor organization of today's Socialist Action League pour Election Socialiste also experienced significant growth during this radicalizing period and played a minor but important role in the Quebec labor movement. Today, the left of the left in Quebec is a patchwork. One minute, Robbie. Thank you. Today, the left of the left in Quebec is a patchwork of contending organizations. And this is probably true more so in Quebec than in English Canada because, uh, in addition to the usual disagreements, we have to factor in the differing attitudes to the national question in Quebec. None of the small groups are in a position to play a leading role, even if they were so inclined. And there's a remarkable lack of collaboration and dearth of strategic thinking. I'll skip over some of the details and perhaps leave that to the, uh, to the uh, question period if, if um, the audience is interested. Well, I think we in Socialist Action and Leap for Action Socialist cannot, it would be fair to say that we do not endorse bourgeois nationalism, but we continue to support the goal of socialist independence for Quebec. This reflects our reading of the Canadian social formation and the legacy of national oppression, which is integral to the foundation of the federal Canadian state, not just in the case of Quebec, of course, but also with respect to the Aboriginal and First Nations peoples. But thinking in strategic terms, Quebec's struggle for national liberation constitutes we believe a key component of the North American Revolution. 
<clears throat> in Quebec, we are faced as much, if not more so than elsewhere, with the paradox of a politically weakened workers' movement a frag and a fragmented socialist left at the very onset of a profound multi-pronged crisis of the capitalist system, as signaled by the coronavirus pandemic. A key tactic, tactic for us to address this uh, paradox and discrepancy is the United Front tactic. It takes account of the differences and divisions on the left while responding to the crisis in the interests of our class. <clears throat> and likewise, this tactic of unity in action promotes the building of a mass revolutionary socialist party, Wrap up, comrade. which we believe is an indispensable step on the path of, a, of an eventual working class seizure of power. That's the only way to rid the world of the predatory and destructive social and economic system that is capitalism and put the construction of a global eco-socialist order squarely on the agenda of humanity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Robbie. Okay, thank you all, um, all of our panelists. And now with the help of our technical producer, Kurt Young, we're going to hear some questions. So the format will be, that he will read three questions. So hopefully you have your pen and paper ready or your keyboard or whatever, and take the three questions and you will have up to five minutes, please, five minutes, each to answer one or all questions. Kurt? Uh, before I ask any questions, um, just to let our, um, our chat know, that there are people who ask multiple uh, questions. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be asking first time, people who've asked a question for the first time first, and then if there's time, we'll come back to you. Okay, so we will start with uh, Daniel Terade. He asks, how does SA respond to the upsurge in support for uh, Keynesian economics in the form of a Green New Deal? The next question is by Emily Janet. With all this sectarianism and division, is an effective united front possible? How can we go about building a better united front that doesn't compromise principles? Uh, the next question is from myself, but um, seeing as uh, it actually echoes the question that Emily put forth, I will not, uh, I will not uh, recite it. And then our following question is from Mitchell Shore. How should SA position itself in relation to the groups such as Black Lives Matter leading the uprising and calling for defunding, dismantling, and abolishing the police? Okay, so we will five minutes each, comrades. We will start with Robbie, then Barry, and then Yvonne. Robbie? Well, I think I wrestle with this question of the Green New Deal as much as, as everyone else on the left, on the socialist left. Uh, I'm a bit, uh, it depends on which version, but I'm a, a little bit critical of the uh, lack of uh, uh, system change that uh, is reflected in some of the Green New Deal proposals. However, I think that uh, in the event that some of these proposals gain, gain traction, uh, we in social section may be in the position of offering critical support. So I, I think it very much depends on which particular version and which components of Green New Deal are, um, are on offer. Um, I don't think that we subscribe to a, a, a Keynesian rescue package to uh, restore capitalism's viability by any means. But uh, nevertheless, uh, there may be some aspects of uh, anti-austerity uh, policies and climate remediation policies that we would be obliged to give critical support to. Uh, well, that's the the, the uh, million dollar question, how to apply the United Front approach in, in reality in concrete terms. I, I don't know. I think there are some examples of it. And I think um, we need to explore these with, with um, components on the left who are open to it. And we need to discuss quite frankly, with those groups where it's possible to collaborate and under, on what basis. So going forward, I think, I think this is a, a work in progress. Uh, we need to uh, propagandize around this concept, but also uh, uh, apply it in, in concrete circumstances with uh, concrete uh, groups on the left with whom we can make, uh, we, can, we can build coalitions and unite in action. 
Um, I'm going to leave the other question for the moment till I hear from the other responders on, on Black Lives Matter and uh, anti-racism. Except to say that, except to say that in Montreal, once again, there was a, a, a massive outpouring uh, uh, about four Sundays ago, I guess, uh, on the streets of Montreal, probably uh, upwards of 75,000 or 100,000 people. So uh, it, it was a very impressive uh, statement of solidarity and support, which I think will give the government of Quebec uh, hesitation in uh, pursuing their demagogic uh, their attempt to exploit xenophobia in the province, which has been one of their main tactics. Okay, thank you, Robbie. We'll move now to Barry. Barry, five minutes. I'm you muted. muted. You're muted. I have to get accustomed to this uh, technology comrades once again. Should always, comrades should always keep an eye on the chat. We give you instructions there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So th th thanks to Daniel for his question about um, the upsurge in support for, for Keynesian measures. I think that it's, it's a positive development, but it's uh, fraught. Uh, the, the positive aspect of it is that it, ex it expresses uh, a desire uh, among millions of people to not go back to pre-COVID times, to the conditions in which there was no universal uh, child care, clearly child care, uh, uh, for working parents, especially working women, is crucial to uh, uh, any uh, serious restart of the economy. Um, and uh, uh, the need for basic income, uh, the need for more housing uh, that is uh, um, accessible, that is quality, uh, that is affordable, uh, the need for uh, transportation systems which uh, break from carbon and are sustainable and, and, and can effectively uh, move people to and fro without resort to private uh, vehicles. Uh, th these are all very positive developments that is a function of the radicalization that has that is the, the fruit of both the uh, the economic depression, which was well underway before COVID struck and that was qualitatively deepened by the pandemic. But Keynesianism, of course, doesn't deal with the, um, the, 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 um, the capitalist mode of production per se. It doesn't take a systemic approach, but it opens the it opens the door. And with the discussion about the um, uh, the government's budgetary uh, uh, situation, the the announcement by the the uh, minister of finance yesterday that uh, certain programs will be continued, but they're looking for a way to exit, shows that um, we have to seriously consider who really benefits from the economy and the trillions of dollars that are in, in, in foreign uh, bank accounts uh, that have escaped the tax collector. Um, the resources of society have to be marshaled in the interest of the vast majority, and this can only be done through public ownership under workers' control, in other words, a new, a new society. So these are the present situations pregnant with the implications of that. Um, we have to go beyond the Green New Deal that is advanced uh, by, by LEAP and the NDP, although it had, they have many progressive features and certainly beyond the perspective of the so-called progressive international, which uh, calls for tax reform, but doesn't call for system change. How can we um, build an effective united front? Well, we have to you know, systematically make efforts, probe all the possibilities for unity in action. So we do that uh, in socialist action by collaborating with socialists in the NDP left, uh, the Socialist Caucus not only advances socialist policy resolutions, but we run for executive positions of leadership against the party brass. Uh, we do the same in the unions uh, through, through uh, our collaboration with uh, others in the uh, radical labor left in the form of the workers' action movement. And something that we're, you know, that we're considering right now, we're advancing a proposal, and this ties into the, the, uh, the third question about um, how we relate to the Black Lives Matter movement and the question of abolition of the police. The Toronto City Council just a week ago decided to actually to increase the budget, uh, the police budget, uh, rather than affect the, the very small 10% cut advocated by about a third of the city councillors. So we're asking organizations on the left to seriously consider a concerted effort to force the NDP to run as an official party in the municipal elections, not only in Toronto, but elsewhere, to demand 
police disarming and, and, and abolition of the police, or run a coalition of socialists that will stand on a program for uh, a radical change at the municipal level. This is another form of the United Front in which organizations can come together, uh, even though they don't agree on everything, they agree on one or two propositions, and they can test their capacity to work together, learn lessons from the experience, and advance the, the perspective of a revolutionary transformation of society. Thank you, Barry. Vaughn? Got to un unmute myself. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start with the second question, which was um, how can we build a collective among the working class despite the sectarianism that is the tendency on the left um, without compromising principles? And this is something that I really think about a lot because, you know, I'm sure it's similar in Toronto, but in Vancouver, there are so many groups of socialists and the divisions between them seem on a service level at least to be rather petty. And when I say rather petty, I mean that we all have the same overarching goal. Our goal is the abolition and destruction of capitalism. And whether we want to replace the capitalist state with a socialist state or with some kind of stateless society or something else, um, before until we get to that point where, okay, capitalism is overthrown, what, what are we going to do now? Until we get to that point, you know, we're all on the same side. And so in, in my view, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, unless that friend has done something extremely terrible. Um, that said, there are definitely socialist groups that I wouldn't recommend anyone associating with. I'm not going to name names right now, um, but, you know, people who have terrible leaders, things like that. Um, oh, there's something in the chat. No, okay. Um, but overall, the enemy of our enemy is our friend in the class struggle. Um, the second one, uh, how can socialist action act in concert with socialist groups like Black Lives Matter and causes like defending the police. Um, well, I think defending the police is a cause that is like perfectly suited to the goals of socialism because honestly, what um, what are the police there for if not to defend private property? And so if our goal is to have a society in which um, wealth is collectively owned and, um, you know, worker co-ops, housing co-ops, things like that, then why would we need police to defend those individual assets? especially when those assets are owned by the rich. That's really when the police are interested because if, if you're making whatever, $11,000 a year and your bike gets stolen and you're living in a basement suite and you call the police, they're gonna laugh in your face. But if your like $40,000 Tesla gets stolen, that's when they're going to act. Um, so it, you know, the fact that the police exist in their current form is in itself emblematic of the class struggle that needs to happen. That said, also, um, socialist action, at least on the West Coast, and I hear on, in Toronto as well, has been collaborating, um, at least on a surface level. We've been turning up to as many demonstrations as we can, really taking the time to educate ourselves and discuss it in meetings, um, and seeing the Black Lives Matter movement as being one facet of a very multifaceted class struggle. Um, I just want to say real quick that there's this tendency in the left to kind of flatten the class struggle and say, you know, um, we all have our different struggles, but overall there's the one, the, it, the only struggle is the class struggle. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, you know, we definitely have more in common with working class people across the world than we have with, um, you know, billionaires in Canada. But that said, working class people around the world all have very different struggles and are all oppressed in very different ways. And so I would really caution socialists, uh, especially white socialists living in Canada, against taking a colorblind approach to class struggle. We really need to see those differences and we really need to treat each system of oppression with a different cure because that's how you, if somebody comes in and they're extremely sick in a billion different ways, you don't just give them one cure-all medicine. You treat the entire body, you treat every aspect differently and that's the way that you're actually going to build that health. So I think that's what we need to see um, a lot more of being discussed, at least in the left. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> Back to you, Kurt. We'll take uh, three more questions. Yeah. Again, I apologize to Sam in the chat, but I'll apologize to him again. I actually uh, went over his question. So the question from Sam is, given the historic isolation at the North American left, is it now more crucial than uh, ever in testing our ideas on the international sphere? Uh, the next question is uh, by Mark Lister. He asks, can we raise class consciousness and convert progressive supporters from pro-capitalist parties, liberals, greens to socialism? If so, how? 
And then the next one question is from Gary Porter, and he asks, how can SA strengthen ties to the BLM and indigenous rights movement and recruit more black and indigenous cadres? Okay, you have up to five minutes each, comrades. Five minutes. And I'm going to start with Yvonne, then Robbie, then Barry. I'm so sorry, I'm still writing down those questions. Um, do you want okay. to start? With and I'll, yes, I'll start with Robbie and come back to you, comrade. Robbie? Robbie, you're Unmute yourself, Robbie. Robbie, you are muted. Okay, I'm going to move to Barry and we will come back to Robbie and Yvonne. Barry? I'm here. Barry. Okay, it's getting, it gets hard to uh, remember to do that. In past broadcasts, we simply were unmuted all the time. All right, um, Sam asks about um, the importance of internationalism. And I think this is a very important uh, point indeed. Uh, the North American left uh, is, um, is, is isolated uh, in relation to the international class struggle because the level of the struggle tends to be lower in, in North America, particularly in the United States, at least until recently with the explosion of anger against um, uh, racism and the mishandling of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, so it is more important now than ever to unite with uh, working people internationally and to build international revolutionary organizations. Uh, you know, the, the revolution uh, unfolds uh, in, in the framework of a, of a given country. Uh, a revolution occurs not everywhere simultaneously, uh, which is the old Stalinist canard uh, that uh, you know, misrepresented the Trotskyist perspective. Um, there is a world revolution, but it, it unfolds the revolution unfolds within national boundaries and then seeks allies because the, um, the rich and powerful on a, on a planetary scale are opposed to workers' efforts to emancipate, in any, to self-emancipate in any country. So they, they know which side they're on and they use uh, boycotts and, and military intervention and economic disruption in every fashion, uh, assassination of key leaders and so on, to try to undermine uh, worker struggle for um, self-emancipation. So we need we need an international solidarity, and we in fact need an international political um, um, strategic uh, co uh, coordination of efforts to advance the uh, the revolution, you know, beyond the boundaries of any one state. And that's why socialist action, despite uh, the sectarian obstacles we encountered uh, against uh, Leninist groups like ours inside the, uh, the Fourth International, uh, to launch uh, within the last. Uh, three years, platform for a workers' international. It includes um, socialists within the Fourth International and socialists outside of it. So we see this as very important and we uh, collaborate. We have speakers from many different countries at our conferences. Uh, we, we visit not only our comrades in the United States, but in other countries as well. We collaborate, we issue joint statements, we defend the strikes, demand freedom for political prisoners. We have an internationalist perspective. While we, de while we defend uh, Palestine and Cuba and Venezuela, uh, we don't support um, uh, bourgeois governments anywhere, but we defend the right of uh, oppressed peoples to um, determine their own future and to resist uh, imperialist intervention, which seeks to thwart their, um, their democratic will. So that's extremely, extremely important and a very high priority for socialist action from its inception to this, to this moment. Um, how can we <laughs> increase our ties with struggles of the oppressed? Uh, the Black Lives Matter was mentioned, uh, the struggles of, of the indigenous, uh, the Wet'suwet'en people, uh, their, and their fight against the um, Trans Mountain Pipeline comes to mind. Well, we, you have to be present. You simply have to participate. You have to build solidarity. You have to put your, um, your, your body on the line, as we did in, uh, in efforts across the country to block railway crossings when the uh, Wet'suwet'en people rose up against the um, efforts to build the um, Trans Mountain Pipeline. 
um, uh, we can we continue in every at every opportunity to uh, to uh, invite speakers from these organizations to our events to participate in their events and and humbly request the right to uh, uh, the opportunity to speak to present our point of view and to extend the hand of solidarity. Uh, our perspective is revolutionary, uh, but, One uh, but in order to succeed at revolution, the working class has to come together uh, at, at the level of its, of its political leadership. That means combating the reformist perspective, breaking working people, and all oppressed layers from the, uh, the, the siren song of the, uh, the parties of capital, particularly the liberal party, and to, to forge independent working class political action under a revolutionary working class leadership. That's what we aspire to, uh, to form and to, uh, and to advance and to win. Okay, thank you. Before I move on to, the, to, to Yvonne, if the panelists would just keep your eyes on the chat column, you will see when your time is up or if you're muted or unmuted, okay? It would, it, it would really help instead of me having to interrupt you all the time. Okay, Yvonne, you're on here. Hi, yeah, so um, I first one was how can socialist action recruit members from capitalist parties, essentially capitalist parties. And I see that happening right now, especially in the younger generations, um, you know, not even my generation, but like Gen Z, like the youngest generation that's not even able to vote yet. They have grown up seeing absolutely nothing good come of capitalism. Like many of them were born right around 9-11 and grew up in a post 9-11 era where we have this horrifying police state, securitization around the globe, and hyper-capitalist, you know, everything is commodified. Even the way that we communicate with each other is this hyper-engineered hellscape. Um, you know, their data, their face is a commodity to be bought and sold. So it, it's no wonder that they're growing up socialist um, and they're educating their parents and they're educating their friends and they're having those awkward conversations at turkey dinner because they're angry and I'm angry. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if there's a lot that we can do, we can hand out pamphlets, we can do these webcasts, we can educate our friends, especially um, friends who are maybe, you know, a little bit better endowed or are making more money and just do not see, just do not see the reason for the class struggle. They don't see beyond their bubble um, and, and having those conversations. But overall, I do see it happening and I think we can't ignore that it's happening and we need to lean in. Um, the second question that I wanted to address was um, how to recruit more black and indigenous voices to the socialist cause. And honestly, it's just platforming black and indigenous voices. Um, a little like moment that kind of opened my eyes was in an activist group that I was a part of. And there was only one indigenous fellow who was a part of it. And there was like 30 other white people. And he was given the same voice as the other 30 white people in the room. So you've got, um, you know, he's got one thirtieth of a say which <laughs> it's equality, but it's not what we need and it's not right. And it's not going to be attracting more like here, come join this group and you can have one thirtieth of a say in these issues, you know, especially when we're talking about things like de decolonization, like what an insult that would be as an indigenous person to have one thirtieth of a say in a discussion in an activist group of well-meaning people about decolonization <laughs> of your land. <laughs> like, um, so, you know, we need to make sure his voice is heard, make, make a greater effort um, to have his suggestions and his ideas incorporated, not just his voice, but to actively take his suggestions and act on them, um, not just because he's one person, but because he's one person and unfortunately the only person representing this hugely underrepresented group. Um, so it, it's hard to think of ideas and suggestions as having race, but they absolutely do. And if you are a BIPOC, uh, Black Indigenous person of color, walking into a white dominated room, um, you know, the white people in the room aren't going to see that, that this, this, the ideas that are coming out of this room are white culture. But you are, and it's going to reek of that, <laughs> and it's not going to make you want to come back. And I think that happens a lot in the left, especially like, you know, you'll have um, some white speakers who like completely tokenize uh, BIPOC in that room. And, oh, well, what do you think? And then not act on that suggestion at all. Just have, oh, there's the voice. That's, that's not what we need to see. Uh, I think we all need to take an exercise in stepping back way more often. That's all I have to say on that. Okay, thank you. Robbie? Yeah, well, um, it's true that the North American left is isolated from 
in some ways from the international class struggle because of our very uh, privileged position or particular position in the heartland of imperialism in the belly of the beast, so to speak. But I, I just think if I compare to the state of consciousness of the North American left uh, in my youth and <laughs> maybe in the 60s and 70s, let's say, um, I think we've made a lot of progress. I think there's many fewer illusions in, uh, for instance, in Canadian innocence, in the innocence of Canada as a, a international player. Uh, there's a widespread recognition that uh, Canada is, uh, you know, a bona fide member of the imperialist club. And I, I'm talking about on the left, clearly, but newly radicalizing youth have no trouble to assimilate that particular lesson. In my day, uh, as, a, as a young activist, uh, there was a very, very strong left uh, Canadian nationalist current. And I'm happy to see to see that kind of laid to rest because I think there's a much better, much clearer vision of what internationalism requires, uh, notwithstanding all, all the uh, difficulties of making that real in, a, in the North American context. Um, I, I do feel like with uh, people of color in relation to socialist groups, that there may be a, a place, I'm not trying to impose this as a format, but there, there's certainly a place for um, separate and independent uh, organization of people of color <coughs> around, uh, around politics and around the expression of their political views. And I think we should feel very open and encourage that uh, when it happens and have to, and try to just keep certain lines of communication open. Uh, so I would make that suggestion, at least throw it out there for discussion. Um, trying to remember what else was, uh, sorry. you know, um, there, there is a, a, a very, a very uh, big movement of solid, a fairly substantial movement of solidarity with uh, migrant workers and uh, people without status uh, in, uh, in Quebec, and I, I hope also in English Canada. I think that's another area where we can stand up and be counted and throw ourselves into a struggle, uh, not because we hope to recruit, but just to be um, on side of that issue and to uh, voice a socialist perspective on it. Thanks. Thank you, Robbie. Okay, Kurt, do we have more questions? Yes, we have. Um... We have actually more than three, but uh, I'll only be r responding to three. So sorry to anyone whom I do not, uh, whose questions I do not ask. So our first question will be from Chad Brazier. Hopefully I said your name correctly. He says, please comment, comment on modern monetary theory. Oh, modern monetary theory. And then our next question is coming from Sam. He asks, the uh, physical newspaper form has been in trouble for a long time with the advent of the pandemic. Do the panelists think the physical newspaper will continue or do we need to find new ways involving instant tech to say scan a paper onto someone's phone? How have some of our tactics changed with pandemic and online work? And our final question is from Emily Janet. She asked, Actually, uh, uh, it's just about to uh, say the wrong one. Okay, she asks, how can the Anglophone left wing better support the Francophone and Quebec, uh, Quebecois labor movement? Though there are all our questions. Okay, so we're going to go back to the panel and we're going to start with Robbie, Zenny Vaughn, and then Barry. Okay, Robbie, five minutes. <clears throat> I'm not an expert on modern monetary theory. I have a certain sense of it as being a bit of a um, a bit of a uh, I guess a, a bit of a uh, a tangent that we don't want to go down, uh, and perhaps uh, I would just say, well, there's a lot of crit criticism of modern monetary theory. I could refer you to Doug Henwood's. Uh, business observer, left business observer. I could refer you to um, Michael Roberts' uh, blog, and uh, and so on and so forth. I think it's a bit of a 
a, a, a diversion from <clears throat> what our tasks are. But I do concede that there's, you know, a bit of a a bit of a theoretical debate about its merits and demerits that we should probably pay attention to. I'm not sure if it's an absolute priority for us to pronounce on it, but that, those are my thoughts on modern monetary theory. <clears throat> um, you know, on the physical newspaper, I'm a bit of a partisan of the of the written page, <laughs> but this may reflect just my backwardness. Or, but you know, I think it's wise to be a little bit to not hop on the social media bandwagon to the exclusion of other modes of communication, even if we have to make room for them. And indeed, in the pandemic, we're relying very much on them and have had to develop some um, comfort and expertise which is not difficult to come by, which is difficult to come by for me, but much less so for younger uh, activists and younger comrades. Um, the Anglophone left in relation to the, I don't, I don't know if you're talking about the Anglophone left in Quebec or outside of Quebec. <clears throat> um, what I demand of the Anglophone left in Quebec or what I feel should be expected from them is that they, throw themselves into struggles as uh, <clears throat> as part of Quebec society. Uh, doesn't mean they have to em embrace or agree on everything that the Quebec left says or think that, uh, you know, the Quebec left is wonderful. That was kind of a problem back in the 60s is that people invested a lot of, Anglophone leftists invested a lot of uh, hopes and aspirations in <clears throat> the bourgeois nationalist current in Quebec. And of course, in, at the end of the day, they became very bittered and disillusioned <clears throat> and now are uh, not really on side in many ways with the whole question of Quebec national oppression, may I say. The labor movement in Quebec is, uh, you know, quite very much in retreat as much or more so than in the rest of North America. And I hope that will change because it certainly has a, a grand tradition of militancy and I hope that will flower once again and then we'll see what kind of tasks emerge and what kind of solidarity is needed whether from outside Quebec or inside whether from Anglophones or Francophones. Okay. Okay thank you. Thank you Robbie. Okay Yvonne. There we go. Um, so I <laughs> I don't know how y'all are writing down these questions but I only wrote down the one. And it's the physical newspaper in trouble. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love newspapers. I love cutting the headlines out of newspapers. I love the feeling of thumbing through them. But given COVID and given just kind of the decline of print media in general, um, I think it'd be great to see socialist action lean into technology really in the way that we're doing with these webcasts. I think these are a great choice. I think, you know, something more bite sized would also be a really great choice. Um, even like, I, you know, I, I hate that a lot of the ways that we communicate digitally are owned by terrible evil corporations that then sell that information and make profit and are responsible for exploitation around the world. I don't really know like how we would be able to um, leverage a di digital presence without leaning into those terrible corporations. Um, because I mean, what, what would be the main ones? Like we would need an Instagram, a Twitter, um, even a TikTok account could be a great opportunity to educate younger people and kind of bring in a new generation to um, traditional socialism. Uh, but I mean, TikTok is owned by a Chinese corporation that blocks hashtags and doesn't allow disabled people on their site. Twitter is owned by a libertarian maniac. Instagram is owned by Mark Zuckerberg. Like, um, so, you know, we really do have to have that conversation. But honestly, overall, and I hate to say this, I think the benefits of leveraging these platforms would outweigh the cons of buying into that kind of capitalist necessity. Um, and I would like to see us, you know, using these platforms to advocate for the expropriation and nationalization of these platforms. Um, I think that would just be like the ultimate sort of uh, schadenfreude if it actually wound up happening. Um, but yeah, that's what I have to say on that. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Barry? Yes, and can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I think I got it right this time. Okay, so um, what do I think of modern economic, modern monetary theory? Well, I prefer the labor theory of value. That's really, <laughs> really all I want to say about it. Uh, we don't need a monetary theory or a fiscal theory. 
we need a holistic theory that grasps the fundamental importance of uh, uh, labor's ability to generate wealth. Um, on the, on uh, you know, the main contributors of wealth are labor and nature, and we need to have a democratic organization. Any any other theory that uh, um, avoids. Uh, the need to seize control of the commanding heights of the economy and op and operate it democratically in the interests of the vast majority of humanity, I think, is missing the mark um, uh, grossly. Um, does the physical newspaper have a future? Well, I think the simple answer is yes. The question is to what extent, where, and how. Uh, socialist action has been no slouch when it comes to uh, um, increasing our uh, social media uh, footprint. Uh, since the um, onset of the, of the uh, COVID crisis in Canada and nor in North America, Social Stack has produced over 30 webcasts. That's 30. There were two a week throughout um, April, May, and a good part of June. Um, we are doing uh, you know, uh, conferences several times a week. Uh, it's Zoom out your yin-yang. <laughs> there's, there's, we're, we're in front of screens more than we care to admit. Uh, our eyes are glazing over. It's important. I don't mean to make light of this uh, very significant breakthrough in uh, communication, uh, and and we're taking uh, as full advantage of it as we can. And we're also involving members, uh, upgrading and developing skills, um, uh, which which you can see to some extent even on tonight's uh, broadcast with new members stepping up. So um, that's um, we take no no backseat to anyone, but uh, and and we are also cognizant of the fact that many people, including some of our own members, have no internet access. So people who live in rural areas, people simply can't afford the the, the, the gouging prices ex exacted by the uh, the telecoms. Another reason why we need to nationalize the telecoms under workers' control and make sure that there is full internet access uh, everywhere, urban and rural. Uh, and take, you know, um, make make sure that people can use uh, these uh, these communication devices. Uh, they're not inhibited by cost. Um, so when will when will newspapers and magazines disappear from the journalistic landscape? Well, when the bourgeoisie stops publishing newspapers and magazines, then we'll know uh, <laughs> the time is it's time has come to an end. But the fact is. Newspapers and magazines are still produced on a daily basis around the world in, in, in their millions, multi, multi millions. And that's because they reach a lot of people that advertisers want to reach and socialists want to reach uh, many of the very same people. Um, I remember attending the um, NDP federal convention that occurred in Ottawa uh, a little over a year and a half ago. And they boldly announced, the party brass did, that the convention would operate online resolutions, uh, procedures, documents, paperless, right? But the convention broke down at several junctures when half or more of the delegates couldn't access the site where they needed the information that was then on the floor of the convention being being dealt with um, uh, by the uh, delegates. So it's, um, it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, we're in favor of uh, progress along that line of development, but uh, we don't want to throw the... Um, throw away the lifeline to communication that links uh, many of many of us, not just older members, but people who can't afford uh, internet uh, access or devices. So that's uh, a very important factor to, to keep in mind. And it's a very good discipline for socialists to learn to talk to people, not just to send them a, a text message, but to go to a demonstration, hand someone a leaflet, hand someone a newspaper or offer uh, it, it, for sale, a newspaper or, 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 or a booklet, like any, any of these, and say, I, I'd like to know what you think. Uh, of course, you, you can find some of these online, but only if you know the titles and where to look for them. Um, so it, 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 it's very useful to be able to hand someone a magazine like the Socialist Caucus uh, Turn Left and say, there's interesting articles here, and I'd like to talk to you about this. I'd like to know what you think about this. Uh, and see if you um, uh, consider the value of what of what we're saying in relation to the the fight against uh, pipelines or or for um, uh, pharmacare 
or, or to stand up for the rights of the Palestinian people for boycott, divestment, sanctions against the um, Zionist apartheid state. Those conversations are very important and developing the skill to engage people is very important and there's probably no better way or one of the very, one of the very best ways is to have a publication at a demonstration and to interact with people with that tool. Thank you, Barry. Okay, so I'm going to go back to each of you for one minute. If there's something that you feel you want to say, it's up to you. So we're going to start with Yvonne, then Robbie, and then end with Barry. So one minute each, if you'd like to say something. Yeah, I just want to say, like, a, you know, a big shout out to the team that's putting these together, especially Kurt. We have had, yeah, over 30 webcasts, and that's a huge, like, it, it's incredible how far we've come, even just in, you know, the four months since COVID started. And I really think these are a great chance to connect with our viewers and to educate people about what socialist action is all about and really what the working class struggle is all about. So I, you know, I'm really looking forward to the next batch of these. I would love to see some like bite-sized ones, like, you know, maybe a 20 minute uh, or even like a five minute, just like a Ted Ed X type thing, like this topic in five minutes. Um, and I, I think that'd be a great outreach tool as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. Robbie? Yeah, I, just on specifics, I, I also like the idea of uh, on-site interviews at demonstrations with, uh, well, not necessarily just with our comrades who are participating in that particular mobilization, but uh, with anybody that we want to, that we think will have a valuable commentary and who has the skills to comment in an effective way. That, that's a very useful uh, thing that we can then use later on to um, disseminate information about the particular action and about the issues that were involved. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I've pretty much I've yeah. run out of, I could talk a lot about Quebec, but I don't think there's really much point in going into um, much. Not in one minute anyway. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Robbie. Barry, one minute. Something I wanted to say earlier, but I, I just um, didn't have the opportunity. And I want to take the opportunity now. Um, socialist action is growing uh, at a pace faster than any of us have experienced over the last uh, 30 years. And we're very pleased about this, and I'm particularly pleased about the growth of our branch in Peel, in, in Mississauga and Brampton. A uh, great majority of our members in the new Peel branch, which is the second or third, uh, yeah, the second largest branch of socialist action across the country, from Nova Scotia to Vancouver Island, um, is majority black and people of color. And when there was a demonstration uh, in, in, you know, at the Brampton Courthouse that marched for uh, seven kilometers to the Peel Board of Education to, to combat uh, systemic racist discrimination in that school board, socialist action was a prominent, was the only left-wing tendency uh, with banners and flags and a, a display table and a number of people joined us at that time. So that's how we need to uh, intersect with the new young uh, uh, fighters that are coming onto the political scene. That's what we seek to do with our with our webcasts. So when we discussed on June 28th, police brutality, the spark for re revolt, we had comrades from the Peel branch and from Ottawa, Sandra Griffith Bonaparte, social action member in the uh, PSAC, uh, uh, um, uh, anti-racist activist, uh, Butterfly, Opal, um, and, 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 you know, by, th by this means, we demonstrate that we're serious about being an integrated revolutionary working class revolutionary organization. And we warmly welcome everyone who is interested in building an alternative to this capitalist system of rot, defamation, and, and, and distress. Uh, the humanity deserves a better future. You can help us make that future. Join with us and build the socialist alternative. Build socialist action today. We warmly welcome you all. Thank you very much. Very. Okay, so special thanks going out to Barry, Yvonne, and Robbie, and of course to our producer, Kurt Young, uh, coming to us from Mississauga, and to everyone who participated in tonight's conversation. So please consider buying a subscription, a sub subscription to Socialist Action Newspaper, only $25 for one year, and it gets delivered right to your door. The postal workers are still working through the pandemic, but let's not forget that. So to fill out this form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. That's www.socialistaction.ca. 
And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just give us a call at 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. And once again, folks, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Now, our next essay web, webcast is on Thursday, a week from tonight, on July the 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And it is titled, A Proletarian Poetry, with Chris Wanamaker, George Elliott Clark, Giovanna Rishi, Eurydice Baumgarten, uh, Corey David, Samita uh, Ra, and Amaral Mirage. And I will be hosting uh, this show as well. And I apologize for, I'm sure, not pronouncing some of these names properly. For the details, just visit www.socialistauction.ca. So in the meantime and between time, folks, please stay safe, healthy, and active. Bye for now.